2020 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, first item on our agenda is um, our roll call. Chairman Chernick. Here. Commissioner Height. Commissioner Height. You know, I said present, but I was muted. I'm present. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Teda. Here. Commissioner Poland. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Okay, that's everybody. Oh, okay. Commissioner, no, sorry, Commissioner Flag. Here. Commissioner Honoron. Here. <clears throat> Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Okay, thank you. Um, so we had a change in our agenda, uh, which is allowed by our bylaws in order to make the meeting more efficient. Um, we moved the Left Hand Brewing Company Beer Garden Extension PZR 2020-4 up to the next item. Now, I believe one of our commissioners uh, may need to recuse himself. Uh, if you, uh, Commissioner Goldberg. Okay. <laughs> Can you speak to that? Yeah, thank Thanks, Chairman. Oh uh, yeah, just due to um, uh, financial interest, um, I have a conflict with this agenda item, so I'll need to recuse myself from this discussion and vote. Okay, thank you very much for, for letting us know that. Uh, Jane, did um, Commissioner Lukacs make it into the meeting yet? No, she did not. Okay, so we'll proceed uh, without seating another commissioner. We still have a quorum with six commissioners present. Um, so I'll turn it over to Principal Planner Brian Schumacher to explain what's going on. Thank you, commissioners. I'm Brian Schumacher with city planning staff. So just to uh, give you some background regarding this item for the left hand uh, brewing company beer garden expansion. Uh, we discovered this week that some of the information that was included in the noise impact assessment uh, needs to be corrected and updated to assess potential noise impacts associated with this project. That said, uh, from the time that we discovered the need to make some corrections, there wasn't sufficient time to update the information that allows staff time to review and evaluate this information prior to tonight's meeting. Since this is an important part of this project's evaluation, the request has been made to continue this agenda item to the July meeting. Uh, we did receive a, uh, a letter from Left Hand Brewing Company's representative, Mary Taylor, who's also at the meeting this evening, if, you, if the commission has questions, uh, to request that this item be uh, continued to the July meeting. Okay, um, Ms. Taylor, would you mind just uh, verbally confirming that, that, that your, uh, your client does want to uh, want the continuance? Yes, thank you. And I apologize if I have some background noise. Um, yes, Left Hand Brewing Company would like to request um, that our item be tabled until the July hearing. Um, as Brian um, explained, we, we just had some data and I wanna thank everyone that's reviewed the information so far and brought it to our attention. So we, we really, really appreciate that. Okay. All right, thank you. So just to be clear, our next uh, meeting is July 15, according to our schedule. Um, we always have an alternate date available if necessary, and that would be July 22. But uh, I don't, until we get to that point, we assume July 15. So um, <clears throat> to make this official, to continue something, we need a motion. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Poland. Um, yes, I move that we move item PZR 2024 to the July 15th meeting. Okay, so we have a motion to continue this item PZR 2020-4 to the July 15th meeting. Commissioner Height. I mute himself in seconds. Okay, so uh, that's a second from Commissioner Height. Um, any any discussion about this from the commission? Seeing none, let's take a vote. Uh, those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, any opposed? 
Okay, so Jane, that is uh, six in favor, zero opposed, no abstentions. So this item is being continued to the July 15 meeting. And um, let me get back to my agenda here. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. Uh, we'll see you in July. Great, thank you so much, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. Okay, thanks, thank, take care. Thank, thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for explaining that. And uh, we'll see you in July as well. Thanks, Brian. Next on our agenda is communications from planning manager, Don Burchett. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you everybody for joining us through the virtual meeting. I just wanted to cover uh, a few things for those people that are watching at home. Hopefully this will allow them to participate from the comfort of their homes instead of here at the uh, Civic Center. Anyone that wishes to speak during public invited to be heard, which is items five and eight on our agenda, or during any public hearing items, agenda item number seven tonight, will need to watch the live stream of the meeting for instructions about how to call in to provide public comment at the appropriate times. Instructions will be given during the meeting and displayed on the screen. And I think you see an example of that right now on the screen. When it's time to call in and provide your comments. Comments are limited to five minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are on the call uh, when you speak. And that is all that I have, Chairman. Thank you, Don. Um, so next item on our agenda is the public invited to be heard. This is for anything that is not on the agenda tonight. Um, so uh, if you want to speak um, about the Betcher annexation, which is a public hearing item, we will have a public hearing section for that item on the agenda. So right now we're asking people to call in um, if they want to be heard on anything that's not on the agenda tonight. And if you do, please dial 1-669-900-6833. And when you're prompted, enter the meeting ID of 873-4889-0. When we're ready to hear public comment, we'll call on you to speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record, and we'll be allowed five minutes to speak. I'll gently cut you off at the end of your five minutes. Please remember to mute the live stream when you're called upon to, to speak. We're going to take a five minute break um, so that uh, our technicians, um, Susan and Heather have a chance to bring you all in. Anybody who wants to speak, we'll, we'll be back in five minutes. Uh, all the commissioners can mute their video and their, and their mics.
Chair, I've stopped the slide. However, it's still being streamed. So give me just a minute and I'll let you know when it stops being displayed. We have no one that has called in at this time. Okay, thank you, Susan. Okay, looks like no one's going to join us. So I'm gonna go ahead and lock the meeting and you can continue. Okay, so we had nobody join us for the public invited to be heard. We'll move to agenda item six, which is approval of our minutes from February 19, 2020. Um, Commissioner Height. Sorry, just continuing to mute myself is troubling. In any event, um, I would move to approve the uh, minutes from the February 8th, 12th meeting. We got okay. to. Commissioner Poland. I'll second that. Okay, seconded uh, to approve by Commissioner Poland. All those in favor say aye, raise your hand. Aye. All right. All right. All those opposed say no, raise your hand. Any abstentions? Commissioner Oneron. Okay, so Jane, that is one, two, three, four, five, six in, in six yeses, zero noes, and one abstention from Commissioner Oneron on the approval of our of our minutes. Um, by the way, just for the record, I want to note that uh, Commissioner Goldberg is uh, basically reseated uh, again after his recusal on the one item. <clears throat> The next item on our agenda is the Betcher Annexation Zoning and Concept Plan, PZR 2020-3 with Principal Planner Ava Parachewski. Good evening, Chair Shernick and Commissioners. Ava Parachewski, Planning and Development Services. Um, tonight, uh, this first item is the Betcher Annexation. And if um, Ms. Wolak could pull up my PowerPoint slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll start with giving you some background uh, on the property. Uh, again, this is about a 10 acre property on the west side of Hover. It's south of Third Avenue and immediately south of the St. Rain Creek. Uh, it's just west of Rogers Grove Park and it is east of Golden Ponds Park and Lycans Gulch. And uh, at the bottom there, you'll see Rogers Road. I'm sorry, um, I don't have the screen, so I can't um, use my arrow. So at the bottom is, at the south of it is Rogers Road, as you can see there, those are golden ponds there. Uh, this parcel in the red rectangle, um, it's, see. oh, there we go. Uh, this parcel uh, is in the red rectangle is zoned agricultural in Boulder County currently. And these properties just south of it are also uh, in the county. Um, in Envision Longmont, uh, we designate this parcel as mixed use employment in this general area. Uh, to the property, to the properties again to the south and west of this property are also uh, unincorporated properties in Boulder County. They're all zoned agricultural, um, but all of these properties are designated as mixed use employment or mixed use neighborhood uh, just to the west uh, on the Envision Longmont plan. Um, and then just to the north of this uh, red rectangle uh, it, by the St. Rain Creek, that is annexed, uh, that is city property uh, and is zoned public. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the applicant's concept plan. Uh, it's very generalized at this point. They do not have a site-specific development uh, in mind currently. Um, and so they're asking for uh, mixed-use employment zoning, which is consistent with the Envision Longmont plan. Um, and the allow, there's many allowable uses, but generally it's for sort of manufacturing office, flex office. You can have some commercial. You can have some live work, secondary use. You can have apartments uh, as a secondary use or hotels as a secondary use. Uh, and at this time, there is no specific um, site development plan. If, if the property were annexed, it, that would have to come back through our system. But as you can see um, on the very on the left side, which is the west side of the property where I have the circle there with the arrow, um, 
the concept plan does show that um, at time of development, they'll provide uh, a pedestrian access to the St. Vrain Green Greenway where that uh, red circle is with the arrow. Um, and then if you look down to the south, uh, you'll see two red circles. Uh, these would be future ve vehicular access points. Uh, again, we, um, we don't recommend, we don't, we don't allow um, vehicular access from an arterial road and Hover Street is an arterial road. Now granted, uh, these are old properties in the county so they do have driveways there right now. Um, as you can see on the south, um, the very bottom there's a road that runs east-west. That's a platted road to Boulder County with a previous plat in the county and that's platted right of way. So we anticipate if they were ever to develop in the future, they would have to lose all their driveways from Hover uh, and come into this road here. And then that's where they would take, they would actually have to improve it into a public street and then take their access there. Um, so the concept plan does have the access points, the pedestrian access, and then in the general notes and, and there at the bottom left with the red arrow, uh, I apologize, but I, I know you do have it in your packet where you could blow it up on your screen. But in the general notes, it does talk about how any future development uh, would need to meet uh, city standards, including any utility design. And so they put that in there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I'm just gonna put in a couple slides about the background of the property and then Barb Brunk from Resource Conservation Partners is representing the property owner and she will um, discuss more detail about the review criteria. I'm just sort of giving you the background. Uh, the one big thing about this property is it is located within the 100 year floodplain. Um, the city has the Resilient St. Rain Project, as you know, um, along the St. Rain Creek, um, but it's only funded up to Isaac Walton Pond, which is off Sunset Street, which is, if you're looking at this aerial map, it's way to the right, because uh, this is over here on the right side. Um, and so we do have plans prepared up to Airport Road, but right now we're only funded uh, to, to Isaac Walton Pond, essentially. And so if this property were annexed, uh, the property owner would be responsible to take care of this floodplain situation and um, build a site to get it above the 100 year elevation. Um, and so I do have with us tonight, if you do have questions about the floodplain issues, we have Monica Bordellini. She's our floodplain manager from Public Works. She's here with us tonight. Uh, we also have Chris Huffer from Public Works. He's the engineering administrator. Um, also can answer questions about utilities and roads. Um, and so, you know, this property does have some development challenges and that's why they don't have a site specific plan. Um, but again, you know, in terms of re the review criteria, it's in our municipal service area. It's surrounded by other areas that have been annexed uh, up and downstream, part of a larger area along the creek corridor that has not been annexed, but somewhat kind of in the middle of a bigger area of properties that have been. And so it's sort of in our interest to be able to responsibly regulate development in the floodplain uh, along the creek. It's critical to the goal of the city's floodplain management regulations. Next slide. And so a couple other background notes. Um, again, this because of the adjacency to St. Vrain Creek, as you can see here in this slide, um, you know, if they were to develop, uh, and this uh, yellow rectangle sort of delineates the property line boundaries, uh, the property owner would be required to provide a 100 foot uh, building and parking setback from the edge of the riparian area. This area in green here sort of denotes where that 150 foot setback would lie. Uh, we did a GIS map there. Uh, and so that's something they're gonna have to work through and consider uh, if they do uh, decide to develop the property. Um, species and habitat, they did submit a species and habitat report. Uh, it, was, it was stated that there was no federal or state protected habitat or plants there. Um, the creek, might provide habitat for the Preble's jumping mouse. Um, there are some eagles, I think, to the west, uh, but they have uh, no habitat at this location. There's no nests here that the report could find. Um, and our natural resources staff uh, noted, um, wasn't in that report, but um, they identified an active red-tailed hawk nest here. 
Um, and so, you know, at time of development, and, and again, we didn't add this as a recommended condition uh, to council because this is all something that would be required anyway. If a development application were to come in, we would ask them to do a fully fresh uh, species and habitat report. And so at that time, um, they, they would have to coordinate with Fish and Wildlife Service, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, and those agencies uh, and, and address the red-tailed hawk nest. But again, that appears to be probably a few years down the line. Next slide, please. Um, on the environmental background, it's in your packet. There was a phase one environmental site assessment. Um, they found no evidence of recognized environmental conditions. Um, this property has historically been used for agricultural. Um, they did note in the report, um, because I know that we did get a public comment in yesterday about it, um, they said that there was a vehicle maintenance garage in there. And if you look in the report, it was essentially full of tractors. So when they say that, it doesn't mean it was a commercial garage. It, it just meant it was, you know, for the occasional use of fixing tractors. Um, the report did say that there were some I don't think they were empty. They were, there were some drums of uh, oil, things of that nature. Um, but it's, um, it's said that they were empty in the report. Um, and so the only other items that were of note were, you know, gas cans and oil cans that you would use when you're changing oil uh, for the tractors. Uh, as, in terms of traffic, um, a traffic study was done for this. Uh, just at, you know, just Imagining the worst case scenario, they put out a potential of 100,000 square feet of warehouse, light, industrial, and flex office on this property. And then uh, that uh, led them to feel that there was be approximately 664 uh, weekday trips if it were fully built out. Uh, the report said that the traffic would not change, traffic from this property wouldn't change the level of service at the intersection of Hover and Rogers, Rogers slash Boston. Uh, it's currently at a B in the AM and C in the PM level of service. Um, and at Hover and Third, it's currently at B in the morning and E in the evening uh, and level of service that is. And so um, the report says traffic at Hover and Third is expected to be level of service F in the, in the PM peak hours by 2040 but it said it, it was with or without this development. So regardless of whether this went through or not, uh, that, that was gonna be the level of service. Um, traffic mitigation, if this property were to be developed, may include a, a northbound left turn lane from Hover into the property. And then if you're coming out of the site on that road on the south, uh, installation of a stop sign as you're approaching Hover. Uh, but again, we would we would require a detailed traffic study uh, when there's a specific development application so that they can evaluate a specific project and then we can um, look at what traffic mitigation alternatives they'll need to do. Next slide, please. Um, and so in terms of community input, uh, we did a neighborhood meeting uh, in October 2018. Um, there were questions about the size and the location of the future utility connections. Uh, there was some discussion about the Lycans Gulch Capital Improvement Project that's just west of this property uh, and the related platted road west of this property. There is a, I apologize, on the concept plan, um, there's a platted north-south road on the western boundary of this property in addition to the east-west road. Um, and then there were questions regarding the status of the Resilient St. Vrain project and how that has improved impacts from the 2013 flood. Um, in your packet, um, I provided, I, I only received one letter uh, during uh, the review process, uh, and that was from an adjacent property owner who stated they were opposed uh, to this annexation because there was a lack of a detailed site development plan. I know we, uh, I and uh, the applicant's representative had some conversations with that individual about uh, why they weren't doing um, a site project right now and the, the floodplain challenges. Uh, and then we got a letter last night from a concerned member, um, and I believe Jane forwarded that to you. Um, and I think she essentially also was opposed, uh, it also because of a lack of the detailed site plan and some concerns about the phase one and, and 
uh, thought maybe there needed to be soils samples. Um, I'm not sure if they fully understood that this wasn't a commercial garage. And a question about whether um, you could uh, prohibit them from uh, getting a variance to the 150 foot riparian setback and I would defer that to the city attorney staff. Next slide. And so uh, as far as recommendation staffs recommending PZ resolution 2023A, um, there were no conditions that we could think of to recommend to you that would mitigate anything here um, other than, you know, it's in a floodplain and that did need to be conditioned. Um, that's just something that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so our next steps, uh, we'll, we're working through an annexation agreement draft uh, among our staff and uh, we'll have it to the city attorney's office soon and then it would go to the property owner. And once we work through the agreement, uh, we'll schedule some city council dates. Those are still to be determined. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Barb Brunk from Resource Conservation Partners, uh, who's a representative for the property owner. And then if you have questions for myself or for Monica Bordellini, our floodplain manager, or for Chris Huffer in engineering, uh, we're welcome, or you're welcome to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. So let's go to the applicant's presentation. Good morning. Good afternoon, Chair. Barb Brunk, Resource Conservation Partners, uh, PO Box 1522, Longmont, Colorado. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I also have a presentation. If Susan could put up the slides. Sure. We'll Just wanted to make sure we saw your camera first. Yeah, I'm here. Thank okay, you. And good. thank you for being here, everybody. And thank you for facilitating this kind of a conversation. It's appreciated. So, you know, Ava kind of talked about this. This is a annexation of about 10 acres. It's um, right there on the concept plan. You can see where it's located in, in the context of Hover and Rogers Road and Third Avenue adjacent to the creek. The property owners are Bill Betcher, Doug and Donna Staver, Corky Rowley, and 201 South Hover LLC, which is a group of the Betcher family, and the same as the applicant. And the applicant's goal for this property is to annex the property and petition it for future development within the city. Um, there's been a couple of kind of uh, questions about why isn't there any detail? These guys are not land developers. Someone else is gonna be the land developer and they think it's in the best interest of both them and the city. that This property is within the city's jurisdiction and that it gets developed some other time in, inside the city limits. Next slide. Okay, again, our requested zoning is mixed use employment. That red line on the map shows the contiguity to the existing city limits. We meet the standard. The total perimeter is 3285.62 feet. One sixth required is 57, sorry, 547.6. And the perimeter contiguous is 1633.56. About nine of these acres belong to the applicants and there's a, a 1.5 acres of uh, platted right-of-way. And really the concept plan is to make a basic framework as a mixed use employment in compliance with all the city standards, including floodplain and riparian protection. Next slide. This property is kind of an enclave and uh, Ava kind of talked about that. On This is the city's annexation map and you can see pretty much all around it is annexed. And this is really one of the last pieces along the creek through this reach that is not inside the city's jurisdiction. So annexation of this property will give the city control of this piece of the river corridor as they move forward with resilient St. Vrain and allow the applicants to develop someday in the future. Next slide. This is just an aerial of what's happening on the property. And you can kind of see the farm buildings and the, there's an, one existing house. And then there's a bunch of um, loafing sheds, that shop that they work on tractors in, a little bit of farm storage stuff. And it's, con it's currently used as a house and agricultural. There are cattle out there. There's, sometimes there are beehives out there. It's that kind of a um, almost craft kind of agriculture that the applicants do on the property. And they would continue that use until it develops in the future. Next slide. 
This is how it fits into Envision Longmont, and you can see that little red rectangle is the um, property. It's designated as mixed use employment, and the requested zoning is mixed use employment, which is consistent with the comp plan. Next slide. Okay, again, this is kind of why it's a vague concept plan. If you look at where this property is in context of that part of the city, it's in a great location for some kind of mixed use. It is close to parks, it is on the greenway, it is close to shopping and entertainment and the employment base in that part of the city. And designating this as kind of a bubble diagram for future mixed use employment lets it meet that standard and it lets the next person design it. But we believe that it'll provide opportunities for light, a mix of uses, including office, light industrial, retail and services, strengthen Longmont's economic base and expand employment, designed to minimize the impacts on the non-residential uses on the adjacent or nearby residential districts and allow and encourage the development of workforce or affordable housing. Again, until the floodplain is fixed, we really don't know what's gonna to happen to this property and, and how to design it creatively to take advantage of that riparian setback and the context that it is. So the goal is to make it flexible for the next person and to pigeonhole it and um, make sure all the notes and the annexation agreement and all those things require any future development of the property to meet the standards in place at that time. Because as you know, code changes, standards change. By the time this develops, there could be another code update. And so the goal is to have it inside the city and ready to develop when a user comes along and it's time. Next slide. Okay, Ava, in your staff recommendation, Ava uh, listed all of the review criteria. It's our job to demonstrate that we meet the criteria. So we believe that the application as submitted is consistent with the comp plan and Envision Longmont and the mixed use employment zoning. Annexation will further the following goals as outlined in the plan. Next slide. So, Goal 1.1, policies 1.1a and 1.1b are really about compact and efficient growth. This site is located within the municipal service area, is surrounded by existing and future development and in close proximity to significant existing and future city improvements and amenities. Existing city services, including water, sanitary and sewer and electricity are adjacent to the property and it's readily accessed by pedestrians, vehicles and transit. It's essentially an infill kind of site located adjacent to a major arterial. Goal 1.2, policy 1.2a is really about creating a sustainable mix of land uses within the city. And mixed use employment is the poster child for that. It has an opportunity for a mix of higher density and office and live work. These residents have really good access to Longmont and the region. Hover Street is a principal arterial. Future improvements provide pedestrian and bicycle connections. You know, this piece will build some of those connections along the eastern property boundary. There's existing transit on Hover and gets them to local services. It'd also be um, a way for people who live in the city to come to this property to participate in whatever happens here. It's a great link to the future trail system. And at the time the property is developed, it will be evaluated in the context of the city sustainability plan in effect at the time the property develops. Goals 1.8, policy 1.8C is about connectivity, greenways, habitat corridors, and community services. And again, annexation of this property makes sure that the city has goals and has control over preservation of St. Green Creek Corridor, enhanced pedestrian and bicycle connectivity along Hover Street, and future streets and pedestrian connections will provide future employees and residents. So it's an integrated system and it gets connected to the rest of the city and within the site. Next slide, please. Uh, goal 6.1 is about attracting and retaining businesses. This will be a site that's ready for someone to come and put in a business at the time they develop, it's ready to be developed and it's got good access and good visibility. 
Policy 6.3, 6.3B is about prioritizing employment uses and diversity of secondary uses. Again, the mixed use employment is a poster child for that. It allows for a really interesting mix of businesses and some secondary uses for residential and commercial uses. So it'll need to be creative and someone will have to do a really good site design to make this work in this location. But I think there's an opportunity to make a really cool project here. Um, in addition to the goals and policies outlined in the staff report, the we think it, it furthers the integrated land use and transportation planning about the multimodal connections. And you, this is just a piece out of the City of Longmont's page. Next slide. This shows the key multimodal transportation elements associated with this property. So the existing greenway is along the north side of the site. We'll have internal circulation both on the road and on the trails that connect to that greenway. Trail system on Hover. There's transit, there's RTD transit in Hover Road and um, there'll be future access on a platted street. Those cross sections are typical cross sections. So it really is connected and it'll provide a really good opportunity for people to use alternative transportation when they come and go from this site. Next slide. The other piece is to maintain a quality water supply. And I think that the Cushman Ditch, which is the water rights associated with this property is number two on the river. And so the applicants give their shares of water to the river is a very senior right. And that contributes to the overall water portfolio for the city. The application as proposed complies with the purpose and the code of the zoning district and will comply with all applicable statute codes and ordinance and regulations at the time it's developed. Provisions in the application assure that that happens at the time it's developed. There's no previously approved concept plan, preliminary plat, PUD, or overall development plan for the property. Uh, the application is consistent with the utility standards. Concept plan as presented shows flexibility for a site specific user, but it does show how the property will be served and how it will be accessed. And the staff has determined that there's capacity in the system to serve the property for future development. Next slide. Application provides development compatible with the surrounding properties. Again, the concept plan is consistent with the comp plan and that looked at that surrounding property. Most of the property around here has been annexed and is positioned for future development. Just that little bit that wasn't included when we were looking at that blue map and it's also designated for compatible land uses. So when, when this applicant paves the street, access will be provided. So it'll make those pieces also come into the system. And any compatibility between the property and the creek will be taken care of at the time the property is developed. That kind of goes to the next one about not adversely surrounding, affecting surrounding properties, the natural environment, city transportation or utilities. Again, this site is in the 100-year floodplain. It is unlikely that it will develop until resilient St. Grain improvements for this reach of the corridor are completed. Ava told you that it's not funded and the applicant understands that. Annexation of the property will assure that the city has land use authority for the property as the planned improvements are implemented. Any future development will be reviewed in the context of the floodplain, the riparian corridor, and the rest of the natural environment. And if you look at that habitat um, assessment, two things. It recommended consult with US Fish and Wildlife and uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife because of the eagle roost and the potential for Preble's meadow jumping mouse. Also, you'll see in the staff report that the staff require an updated habitat study at the time the property is developed. Same thing with transportation. A transportation impact study was um, provided, and it will also have to be updated to make sure that anything that needs to be done is consistent with the uses at the time the property comes through the system. The other thing about the red tail hawk, this is the first summer that the red tail hawk has been there. The applicants know that it's there. It used to be on a, a neighboring property and the tree that it was nesting got cut down. So it relocated onto this piece of property. So it's happily here and um, they'll have to comply with anything that's there at the time they develop. Next slide. This is a resilient St. Grain piece. I'm sure you guys have seen this many times, but 
This is reach three and it's the unfunded reach of the creek. And you can see the site is that red rectangle and the green is where the floodplain would be if that those improvements are made. And there are two different alternatives for that reach of the creek. One is upsizing the bridge at Hover Road and the other is a bypass channel. So those two maps are there. Last I talked to somebody and um, staff can confirm this, the preferred alternative was the bypass channel. But again, this is unfunded. And so um, until it would be funded, the burden of bringing the property out of the floodplain would be on the applicant as it moves forward. And they would have to comply with any regulations both in the city and the federal level, uh, level for the um, FEMA. Next slide. Okay, this is um, about compliance with the sustainability evaluation system. And we don't know yet what's gonna be on this property. And so that evaluation is gonna change at the time the property develops. We do know that it's next to the creek and there'll be a setback. And that setback could be different at the time it develops because as everyone knows, the river moves around. So that wiggly line is about the distance um, but at the time it develops, we'll look at that again. Sustainability practices are changing by the minute. Um, updates in electricity, water conservation, all kinds of things are moving, are moving targets. And so as this property develops, there's an opportunity to meet innovative, integrated sustainability goals. And that would be evaluated, It'll come back to you guys with a preliminary plat at the time it develops. Next slide. We already looked at this, so I'm going to skip over this. This is this actually says that it includes an appropriate transportation plan. And so this is really about adjacent streets, internal streets, connections to the Greenway. And it's the same slide we looked at before. So it's about a multi a integrated multimodal approach to connection. And I think we meet that standard even with the basic framework as shown. Next slide. This is the annexation review criteria. The big picture is it does meet the um, Municipal Act of 1965. The key components of that are that it meets the contiguity requirements, total perimeter 3285.62, 16 required, 547.60, and 1633.56 are contiguous. The site is surrounded by annex undeveloped and developed land and adjacent to existing transportation utility infrastructure. The entire width of the adjacent platted right of way is included with the annexation. The property is within the municipal service area and the Longmont planning area. Next slide. The proposed zoning is consistent with the mixed use employment and the uh, designation on the Envision Longmont as a mixed use employment. The annexation will not limit the ability to integrate the surrounding land into the city. I think that if anything, this will help integrate the surrounding land into the city because we have that platted right of way and at the time this develops, they'll have access through that way. Um, and unless otherwise agreed to by the city, the landowner has waived any pre-existing vested property rights. The only thing that applicants want, there are no vested property rights, but they just plan to continue to use the property as it is until it's developed at some time in the future. Next slide. One up. Um, this is about the phase one and um, next slide. This is it. back up. Sorry about that. Give me one minute. My mouse slipped and we went too far. Yes, we did. I can talk while Susan is looking for the slide. Um, the phase one environmental site assessment was prepared for this property and the staff reviewed it and agreed with the findings that there were no significant environmental concerns on this property. The, um, we had a, a question from a, a landowner about the stuff inside the shop, which Ava kind of spoke to. I mean, it's a tractor maintenance place and um, empty barrels and, um, that shop has a concrete floor and no drain. So there's no 
even if somebody spills oil when they're changing the oil on a tractor, they have kitty litter and um, cardboard there to pick it up and then they throw that stuff away off site. You can help me slide. get to, okay. Next slide. This is where we wanna be. Thank you. So um, I would just like to, in the big picture, go through those comments and those questions that uh, Julie submitted to the board. Again, her first one was really about why the concept plan doesn't have detail. And I think we've talked that through already. Um, her concern was about the a car maintenance. And as Ava said, this is a place where they come and work on the tractor. So it's not a car maintenance shop. And the, um, the finding of the report was that there are no environmental conditions. Um, the other piece is about the wildlife habitat study having been done in the winter. I think that the, the professional that did this analysis looked at the site for habitat and things and actually brought up the fact of adjacent habitat, didn't find any wetlands, didn't find any endangered species, but recommended that we consult with US Fish and Wildlife and CPW at the time the property is developed. And also, the staff has indicated that we'll have to do an updated habitat conservation plan at the time the property develops. So I think those things, um, I think answer the questions of the, of the person who wrote the letter. I won't speak for her, but that would be the way I would answer those questions. We believe this request meets the criteria for approval as outlined in the code and respectfully request that you forward to city council with a recommendation for approval as outlined in PZR 2022A. And I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Brunk. Um, do we have any questions from the commission right now before we go to the public hearing part of this item? Seeing none, let's um, let's get to the public. Uh, let me find my right script here. Okay, for any public wishing to speak on this public hearing item, please call in now. The information uh, I'm about to read is displayed on your screen. Uh, dial 1-669-900-6833, and when you're prompted, enter the meeting ID 873-4889-6210. When we are ready to hear the public comment on this item, we will call you uh, to um, speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record and will be allowed five minutes to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when you're called upon to speak. We're going to take a five minute break to allow this process to occur. Uh, we can mute our sound and video until then.
Chairman, we're at about four minutes. Okay, then two. We'll give it just a few more until it clears the screen, which it has just done. You may continue. We have okay, no one. So, so no one joined us for the public hearing part of this item. So we will go to discussion amongst the commission uh, in questions. Uh, let me get to my gallery view so I can see you all raising your hands with questions and discussion. Commissioner Poland. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if this is going to be for the city or for the applicant, but uh, is the current building that is on the property, is that actually within the uh, repairing setback? Yes. And is that going to, we don't know if that's going to stay there or if they're going to remove it. We don't know that yet, correct? It's going to stay there for the foreseeable future. Anything that happened at the time it would develop would have to comply with the regulations in time at the time of development. But it's been, they've been farming that ground. It's been like that for a long time. So it's not new to the corridor. Um, what is the zoning to the property to the west? Ava? Boulder County Agriculture. Yeah, she okay. beat me to it. <laughs> for for uh, Longmont. Sorry. No. It's uh, it's in Boulder County. It is, but what's it in the uh, Longmont Envision? What's it? Oh, what's its Envision Longmont designation? Yeah. It, um, um, it looked orange without yeah, so lines. Pardon? I'm sorry. It looked orange without uh, lines. Yes. So the orange is um, mixed neighborhood, I believe. Okay. Everybody can't find that. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's a mixed neighborhood. It is. Okay. Um, do we have any time limits for the public meetings for these? Because I noticed that the public meeting was approximately what, two years ago? Is, do we have any kind of time limits for that? There are no stated time limits in the in the code. Um, yeah, I think the uh, application came in in 2019, uh, and Barb can speak to that more. The way our process works is uh, after the neighborhood meeting, you turn in the formal application. Our development review team reviews what's submitted, and they send back comments. Um, th these things are vetted several times before they ever approach you all. And um, there may be some, I think there was some lag time uh, on the applicants end once we turned comments back to them in terms of resubmitting, uh, resubmitting a revised plan, if you will. And um, Barb, uh, why annex now? Why do they wanna annex it now and sit on the property? I mean, what's, what's, what's the benefit for them? I, I think I understand the benefit for the city and being able to control uh, some of the work being done along the creek, but what's the benefit for the applicant getting it uh, annexed now? I think there's a couple benefits. One is they they, they have a um, a firm future, so they know that if something is going to happen to the property, it's going to happen inside the city limits. I also think that they are, you know, they're local people and they're local business people and. In the context of the resilient same brain, it just makes sense for it to be inside the city as that moves forward. I, the, again, these guys are not developers. They're, it's probably their kids or their grandkids that are going to be the person who's going to be, you know, the beneficiary of a development project on this. But they're local people and corporate citizens. They've been here a long time and they feel like it's better for them and for the city if they're inside the city. And um, we went to council and they referred us through the process and we've been chipping away at it ever since. So. I don't think it's an urgency, but they believe they are better off inside the city limits than in Boulder County. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Anybody else? Commissioner Height. Apologies for my ineptness. 
Um, Ms. Brunk, I also have a question for you too. In looking at the environmental okay. status, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, in looking at the environmental site assessment, I think it's page 11, there's a picture um, of a former chicken coop and three barrels of, um, I guess, lubricant and oil, as well as apparently a, a, a water drum. Um, and Mr. Betcher, when asked, said, hey, those drums were never used on our site, begging the question, so somebody dumped them there? How did those drums get there? I, you're the um, owner's rep. You know, right? I don't know for sure, but I do know that um, it's a farm piece of property. And sometimes something that somebody who is also farming another piece of property uses someplace else, it ends up in the storage on the farm, on the other farm that they own. Um, they were empty barrels. And so the um, when they did the phase one, there was no issue, that no concern that they were a contamination issue. And they'll be disposed of properly, whatever that is determined to be. So but I don't think somebody, I don't think somebody just took them and dumped them there. I think they appeared as part of someone else's, someone in the group's agricultural comings and goings on the property. Fair enough. Commissioner Goldberg. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Brunk, for a thorough presentation. Uh, I think my question will be for Ava, although Ms. Brunk may be able to chime in as well, and maybe even Monica. Um, it's really simple, and it just speaks to my naivete in, the, in this topic. Uh, is it commonplace to fill, uh, to fill a site to what I take to raise it up above the 100-year floodplain? Is this practical? Does this happen all the time? or you know, do we have any examples of places where that's been done? I, I do recognize that a thorough concept plan is in, um, required at this time, but just curious about the logistics of doing that. I will defer that question to our floodplain manager, Monica Bordellini. If Monica, you want to uh, start your video and unmute yourself. Can you see me? Here I am. There we go. Thanks, Monica. Hello. <clears throat> um, yes, this is a, uh, we have tried, we are trying to fill some sites um, and remove them from the floodplain that way. Um, let's see, the project that is in review right now to the south, that's called, um, what is that called? Um, Help me, guys. What is the project to the south called? We don't have a project to the south. You were talking about the adjacent neighbor uh, with a FEMA appeal, but that's not a project. No, 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 not that. Fairgrounds, um, Marketplace. Oh, Fairgrounds Marketplace. Fairgrounds Marketplace, sorry. Fairgrounds Marketplace. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of it there for a second. Um, they are trying to fill their site to remove it from the floodplain. And um, you know, there's complications because you can fill a site and, and Longmont allows that, but you can't impact anybody, any other property owner um, or any other building right. that's in the floodplain right. um, with what you do with filling your site. So you couldn't raise- Sending the, water elsewhere. Right, so you fill up a site, the water has to go somewhere else. And if it goes somewhere else onto someone else's property and puts them in the floodplain or raises the floodplain on their property even higher than it already is, that's not allowed. So that's been a little hard for them, but this particular site doesn't have anything around it really. Okay. And um, if, the, yep. if, the, um, if there is an increase, let's say on that house that's there already, well, that's gonna be gone. So that's allowable if it's on your own property. So I, I, and it's an AO zone, which means that um, it's not a um, conveyance zone, which means the water isn't really going through there. It's kind of a shallow flooding area and um, it's only about a foot deep. So I think that actually with 
some of the projects we looked at recently for filling the entire site, this seems more applicable than some of the other ones that we've looked at, to be perfectly honest. Okay, thanks, Monica. I appreciate that, that perspective. <laughs> Good. Quite, quite a bit. Any other questions, comments, motions? Uh, Commissioner Tetta. I think uh, I think Commissioner Poland brought up a really good point about the existing structure being in the riparian setback. As it stands, I, I think if we're considering annexation not to require that those riparian setbacks be respected would be remiss at best. What do you think? Is that, I, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm posing that to the commission. Ms. Brown, or, actually, before we get to you, let's go to uh, Commissioner Flake. I realize I have to mute it at the bottom, sorry. Um, Ava, I have a question regarding um, the process for putting together a site plan when and if the annexation would be approved and how then the um, riparian setback is addressed. Um, it, my reasoning for posing the question is because if they're not submitting a site plan to change anything, then they can still use the structure in place and for the time being. Uh, Chair Shernick, Commissioner Flake. Um, we would, uh, so the mixed use employment, um, it only allows residential type or ag, I don't even know if it allows ag, but it only allows residential uses as a secondary use. Um, so we would have to, uh, examine that and see if uh, we need to incorporate uh, a grandfather right, if you will, um, for a certain period of time in the annexation agreement. Hmm. Um, Ms. Brunk, I, I mean, uh, have you make a comment here? Okay. Yeah. I just, there are existing structures in the 150 foot riparian setback all over our city. And I have not seen, and I might have missed it, an effort to require people who own those properties to remove them from the riparian setback when they have historically been located there and been in that context. I completely understand that when you develop the property, you have to meet those standards. But this property has looked like this for a long time. And I can tell you that the applicants I don't have them in the room with me, but requiring them to remove existing structures on the property um, seems a little over. That would just be my request. That you, that you know, there. If you go down the go down the corridor toward, um, I mean, look through Boston and and through where where the old Golden site is. And lots of bu buildings in the riparian setback that have coexisted with the setback for a long time. So I get that you might have to take it away later, but the applicants really want to be able to continue to use the property as they have historically used it until a site plan would go through the process and for development. That would be my two cents. Thank you. Commissioner Flake. So if the property is not annexed into the city, then it's the way that it is and we and the city has no control over enforcement uh, enforcement of the riparian setback should there be some development proposed. Whereas if we do annex property into the city when the property is redeveloped, then we would have the tools to force the riparian setback. Is that a correct statement? Uh, that's a question for staff, that, that'd be correct. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Teta, to, to your question and, and, uh, and the discussion here, um, I think we have further bites of the apple 
uh, in terms of the riparian setback uh, and enforcing it. Um, I see Ava nodding her head that that is probably factually correct. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we also, with the variance process, we are never obligated to approve a variance. Um, and does it make sense to lock ourselves in right now to saying absolutely no, no variance ever? Or should we let future decision makers decide once a site plan review or a plat comes along to determine what happens in relation to the riparian setback? Um, I don't know. It's it, I, I'm a little mixed on it myself, but um, but those are some things to consider. Commissioner Oneron. I believe uh, the answer to your question depends on the specificities of the proposal that is going to be on the table. I don't think we should make a blanket decision right now without really seeing what the proposal is going to be. Uh, again, you know, uh, like I said in the past, uh, I questioned the riparian setback in special conditions. To me, it shouldn't be a blanket rule that should be applied all the waterways, no matter what the proposal is gonna be. That's my personal opinion. So here's, here's another idea, um, just popped in my head, uh, given what Commissioner Omeron said. And we saw the one drawing where, where you see that the riparian setback is basically halfway across this property along its length. So you're really only going to be able to build along this, this bottom half. But what if somebody came up with, with some idea where they could put little jetties out over, you know, with minimal footprint, like just, just you know, with, with concrete posts into, uh, into the ground to hold up like viewing platforms and it would still allow water, still allow wildlife to flow through, still allow everything to be as natural as possible, except for like a dozen concrete posts. Is that cool enough to, for the city to allow a, a variance for? I mean, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here, this is a lot of what if, but maybe it does say that, that, that we should allow this decision to be made in the future rather than now. Other thoughts? Commissioner? Yeah, I'm, I'm all for leaving it for the future commission uh, to haggle over, uh, as been stated here. We don't know really what the floodplain is going to look like uh, when this is developed. We don't know exactly what's going to be developed there. Um, you know, there's also the thing, this could be a historical building and we don't know what that may do with whatever happens with that part of the property. So I'm all for letting this go the way it is. Don't put any kind of conditions on it for, you know, preventing future variances or anything, but just let it ride and then the future commission can handle it when it comes to them. Okay. Commissioner Goldberg. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Yeah, I'll echo similar sentiments uh, as Commissioner Onron and, and yourself, Chairman, and Commissioner Poland. And uh, if you don't mind, slide the topic a different direction. Um, Ava, this question is for you. Uh, Jamie Simo, excuse me while I read, and Seth Vidal, uh, two of the folks who turned in um, concerns about the project, both echoed similar sentiments about reflecting the lack of detail on the project. Uh, you know, and, and who can't under you know relate to that and and wanting to know more what when you when you see a neighbor moving in can you clarify uh if and when uh perhaps closer to the time of development when the neighbors might be brought in to um have opportunities to provide feedback on the project um, is it do they definitely have an opportunity to do that do they only have an opportunity if if the future project requires a conditional approval or a variance, could you just touch on 
maybe to help give them comfort as to when they might be able to provide more feedback as it comes to light. Certainly, uh, Chair Shernick, Commissioner Goldberg. Um, so in terms of public process, um, and again, you know, they'll have a, a, another opportunity at city council, but you know, as, as far as development, uh, when and if this develops again down the line after the floodplain issues are resolved, um, it, it depends on what type of development they're asking for. But um, like, for example, if it's a preliminary subdivision plan, uh, that would require a neighborhood meeting. Um, so certain what we call major development applications would require a neighborhood meeting prior to. So um, if it's something administrative and small, it wouldn't. But um, in the absence of knowing, we just don't know. But there is opportunity for input whether or not there is a neighborhood meeting because um, even if it's an administrative review, we send out notices to a, a certain radius of property ownership, 1,000 feet, 300 feet. Uh, we signpost the property, uh, things of that nature. So there are opportunities in the future if development were to present itself for the public to engage with us and give us input. Thanks, Ava. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to just to recognize not only on council, but perhaps down the line, um, any major development, you are definitely going to have um, plenty of notice to uh, come to a neighborhood meeting and provide feedback. If it's only a, you know, a minor change or a minor development, well, then it's, you know, probably not a, a very unusual project anyways. Uh, but even then, there might be opportunity to provide their feedback. So that gives me comfort. Um, thanks. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to approve PZR 2020-3A to, oh, <laughs> okay, to uh, approve the uh, annexation uh, of, of this property without conditions. Um, uh, Commissioner Pollan. I will second that motion. So it's seconded by Commissioner Pollan. Um, any further discussion? Let's go ahead and, oh, Commissioner Goldberg. Oh. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, um, I'll be supporting the, the motion as well, um, but just wanted to lay out why. Uh, the, I just wanted to thank the city again, the staff again for providing the material in the packet, which identified and summarized why this application met the review criteria uh, and the additional criteria requirements uh, tied to the annexation. And then also uh, the applicant did a thorough job on her presentation, uh, highlighting how uh, this project is meeting all the criteria. Uh, and then given the um, feedback from the public, um, there's opportunity to offer, your offer their feedback in the future. Um, and any concerns about the habitat, uh, the riparian setback, um, and concerns about when studies were, were handled uh, will all be um, revisited again in the future as the project develops. So uh, with that, I'll be supportive. Okay, and, and let me just add to that, that and I think Commissioner Flagg uh, referred to this, that um, bringing this under the control of the city is uh, better than leaving it under the control of the county. Uh, Commissioner Height, you had a comment? I did, um, I was gonna add in my two or three cents as well too. Um, as we had discussed back in February with a, a different annexation, um, as Commissioner Pollan had pointed out, the public meetings for this particular annexation were held some time ago. And we discussed back in, in February that there is no time limitation on from when the public meetings are first held to when the, the project actually gets in front of us. That might be something we want to address at some time in the future, but nonetheless, stare decisis, it comports with our past practices. Um, secondly, I've been looking at the city's code um, and the Resilient St. Rain project and development in the floodplain, all is prospective looking. Um, so to answer, I think, uh, Commissioner Tedda's question about whether or not we should be addressing the fact that one building right now is located in this riparian setback zone. Um, I, I think as Ms. Brunk points out, 
Um, there's a lot of other buildings along the corridor that sit in that same position. And I don't think that the city is regulating those structures out of existence yet. If any future development takes place, then it, the, the property has to be brought into compliance. Um, and then lastly, um, also as discussed in February, the lack of specificity um, in the annexation plan um, is just the nature of the beast. Uh, the public's concerned that they'd like to see more of what the, the neighbor is bringing to the table um, is something that just isn't addressed at this issue. With that, I'm gonna be in support of this project as well, thanks. Okay, and Commissioner Heights last comment reminds me to remind all of our viewers, all of the, the members of the public, be neighborly with each other, talk to each other, uh, find out what's going on. Um, you know, uh, communicating with, with your neighbors is a really good thing. Um, any further comments? Let's take a vote. Those in favor of passing 2020-3A, say aye. 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 Um, that passes unanimous. Oh, uh, any, any not in favor? Any no's? Any abstentions? Okay, Jane, that uh, passes in uh, unanimously, seven to zero. Uh, Ms. Brunk, thank you for your time in presenting uh, the project and walking us through that. Thank you to Monica Bordellini and um, uh, Chris Huffer for being here uh, to help us out with uh, any issues that might've come up with that. Um, appreciate all your help with that. We have more of an agenda. Oh wait, I have a process notice I need to read. Hang on, I gotta find that. I'm a little thrown off my game because I don't have things laid out on my desk. Okay. You couldn't tell, Chairman, you couldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> this item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you are unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear, appear before council, please contact the planning division for further information at 303-651-8330. Alrighty. Um, Next up on our agenda is the final call for the public invited to be heard. Um, and so you'll see this information on your screen. I'll read it again. If you want to talk about anything that was not on tonight's agenda, we'd love to hear from you. So please call us at 1-669-900-6800. And when you're prompted, enter our meeting ID, which is 873-4889-6210. When we're ready to hear public comment on this item, uh, or just hear your public comment, we'll call on you to speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record, and we'll be allowed five minutes to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when you're called upon to speak. It takes us about five minutes to allow everybody to call in. So we'll take a five minute break.
share it at just about four minutes and I'm going to stop the screen share. There are no callers at this moment. Okay. Thank you, Susan. We'll let it stop displaying here in a second. Okay. I think there are small members of the public uh, behind Commissioner Goldberg occasionally. I see them <laughs> running back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take myself off mute, but then you'd hear the bedtime routine of the Goldberg household. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, you're ready to begin. There are no callers. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Um, okay, so uh, we had nobody join us for the um, public invited to be heard. So we move on to item nine, which is items from the commission. I actually have something I wanted to mention to you all. Um, having gone to uh, the RMLUI conference in the past uh, due to the generosity of the city um, down at the University of Denver, I'm on their mailing list and some of you probably got an email from them. They're holding a um, hour and a half uh, ideas roundup is what they call it. Um, and it is about, uh, let me find, the email here, I thought I had it. Here it is. It's conversations on urban planning and land use pandemic and race. Um, uh, so it's race, equity and land use. Um, I wanted to bring that to your attention. It's an hour and a half, it's free, it's open to the public. You do need their email in order to have the, the registration button. Um, so I'm going to forward this to Jane, and she can send it out to everybody uh, in case you're interested. Um, anything from anybody else? When is it, Chairman? When is that meeting? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. It's on Tuesday, June 30th, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., and it's, uh, it's being held on Zoom, and they'll, they'll send you the link. So. Great. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, okay, uh, any items from Council Representative uh, Aaron Rodriguez? It's good to see you guys all, all look pretty well in your home offices or whichever room of the house. Um, and thanks for all that you guys do. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, any items from our uh, Planning and Development Services Director now, Don? Mm -hmm. Manager? Just manager. Okay. All right. Well, first, I just wanted to thank everybody for the great work you did tonight. Uh, really appreciate all the help from Susan and um, also from Heather. Everybody, you know, made this happen. And we appreciate that everyone was willing to help work with us to make this a reality. So again, thank you so much. Um, just a reminder, then, as everybody's aware of, we are looking thin at a July 15th Planning Commission meeting for the item that was continued. Right now, we do not expect any other items to be on that agenda. Um, it, we expect it to be virtual as well again. And so we will uh, work with you to make sure that everyone's able to participate and provide comment on the application. So that is all that I have for tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Don. And also um, want to reiterate thanks to, um, to Susan Wolleck and Heather McIntyre for their technical help and also to Jane uh, our executive uh, secretary on this and recording secretary for everything she does for us. And Jane, just so you know, I will, um, I will get you a scan of the signed PZR. Um, not tomorrow, going to the art museum, but on Friday. Um, so um, I move that we adjourn if, unless there is anybody opposed. Have a good time. See you, see you in a month. Thanks everybody.